Hello and welcome to the small little booster video looking at motifs. Now we will talk about motifs with other students however we're going to look at it in a bit more depth particularly for looking at getting above a grade 7 in the GCSE English Literature exam. Now the exam paper whether it's for Romeo and Juliet or Christmas Carol it will ask you to look at really the extract and the bigger picture and motifs are really really handy because they allow you to look at the bigger picture and be able to look at threads across the text and so that's what we really need to see in your essay when you're writing about Romeo and Juliet and Christmas Carol so that you zoom in on the small picture which is probably quotations and you've got an extract but then linking it into the wider things and so we're going to have a look at how you can use motifs to do that today. Now, a little bit of a guideline about how to write your paragraph. OK, so you need to be starting with an idea or an opinion in your paragraph. Then you use evidence to support it and then really need to build a case. And so when we're talking about motifs, motifs are really good for building a case because of what it allows you to do is it goes, well, it happens here, but also it happens elsewhere in the text. And that's really what we're looking for at a strong response at GCSE, that you've built a case. And building a case is from more than one piece of evidence. So you're saying this idea, but I can see it here and here and here. And motives are absolutely brilliant for doing that. Now, start off with, and this is probably an easier way of explaining what a motif is, a motif is a running image or pattern. Okay, and so we tend to have it in terms of wallpaper, this idea that you see something repeated again and again. Now it might be shown in different ways. However, writers use motifs often in their writing. And when we're looking at Christmas Carol and when we're looking at poetry and when we're looking at Romeo and Juliet, we can see a number of patterns. And that's really what we want to be looking for. So we're looking for patterns looking for connections but something that can help us link across parts of the text because really it helps to show the examiner that we understand the text in quite a lot of detail but also it allows us to step back and think about what the writer's grand design now to explain it a little bit further i'm going to look at christmas carol now the motif of temperature all the way through Christmas Carol, we keep having this reference to temperature. Now, in the beginning, we have Scrooge, who is cold himself. He's got blue lips. And we know that certainly it's foggy and cold at the beginning of the story. OK, so we see that image there. But also then we see how Scrooge in his office has got a small fire and Bob Cratchit has got an even smaller fire. And so we see heat in A Christmas Carol used at the beginning to reflect ideas but then as we go through the story we see it in different ways so for example we see the coldness around scrooge when he's at school but then we've got the heat of the candle of the ghost of christmas past then when we look at stave three and we look at how the ghost of christmas present actually has a fire he's got a torch that he's carrying around with him so we've got the idea of heat and light again but then we see the cratchits around a fire and this idea of warmth and Dickens even goes further because he then shows us about miners gathered around a fire working together and united together and then we see in stay four where the temperature drops and where it's quite cold because Scrooge is dead and Scrooge is on his own and his body that's in the room itself and then finally at the end of the story it's sunny and the fog and the snows disappear. So temperature plays again and again and again in Christmas Carol. And so what it allows you to do, it allows you to make connections across the story in terms of ideas and in terms of things. And actually, you don't need that many quotes when we're talking about Christmas Carol. When you can say, well, the weather at the opening was cold and foggy. At the end, it was sunny. And quite easily, you can put some of those words into inverted commas and they can be quotations. So there are lots of different motifs in texts. And so one of the things that you can do is kind of make those connections as you go along. And one of the things I would try and do at the stage is kind of have a look what different motifs there are in stories and how you can kind of link them together. Because usually what motifs allow you to do is build that pattern 
and the understanding of the big picture. What is going on in this story itself? So we're going to Romeo and Juliet, and we're going to look at one particular motif, and we're going to explore that motif in a little bit of detail. OK, now I'm going to include lots of quotations and you don't really need hundreds of quotations, but it's just to give you the examples and the ideas, because really you can just use the quotation what I give you, which is one word. OK, so you can see how we go along. So Romeo and Juliet, we're going to have a look at the motif of plants and how we see plants in the play. So if we start off. Now, there are different aspects of plants that we're going to look at and we're going to see how they're used in the play in particular. Now, what's quite interesting that in the opening of the play, both Montague and Capulet refer to Romeo and Juliet as being buds. Now, what we know buds to be is that they're not quite ready. They're not quite developed. OK, and so we've got the father referring to himself as the envious worm. OK, so his his son is a bud who's kind of hiding himself away. OK, and then Capulet in Act One, Scene Two, when he refers and talking to Paris about looking and seeing all the different women about, he refers to her as a bud and he even states that she's not quite ready. So both Montague and Capulet at the beginning of the play are already clear in their heads that their children are not quite old enough, really. They're not quite developed. OK, and then. In Act Two, we see Juliet using the phrase again, the bud of love by summoning summer's ripening breath may prove bounteous flower when we next meet. And so we see in Act Two this development, this movement from bud to flower. And obviously we know from biology that when a flower is flowering it is part of that kind of that sexual reproduction process and so actually when we're talking about buds we're talking about sexuality and we're talking about how um, how suitable they are for sex and so that's what we're seeing in the story and so you can see the fathers now this obviously contrasts later because Capulet then is quite happy for Juliet to marry but at this point at the beginning of the play he's kind of as I said a good dad in inverted commas, because he's saying that she's not quite ready. Give her a bit of time. OK, so that's how we can look at buds. Now, we can go further because we can have a look at how flowers are used. Now, we talked about flowers being a symbol of sexuality and this idea. Flowers are tend to be beautiful. They're there to attract the insects so that they can spread the pollen. And they can move it on there. So it's interesting that when Lady Capulet and the nurse talk about Paris, they talk about him being a flower and this idea of possibly being he's sexually active or sexually ready. He's ready to mate. And so and notice and obviously the nurse refers to flower in faith, a very flower. Now, we know the nurse is quite sexual in the language. And so the repetition is, you know, she's kind of doing the wink, wink, nudge, nudge. But also we have this idea of seasons as well. Summer equals fertility and reproduction. And so we can see these ideas here. OK, so which contrast to the opening that we had with the father. OK, the mother is talking about sex alongside the nurse. So you can see a change in attitudes that we've got. And then we see Romeo. Now, Romeo gets a little bit confident after meeting Juliet and he talks about flower. And you can see that there's quite a sexual element in there. OK, so this idea pink for flower. Well, my pump is well flowered. This idea of flowering and deflowering refers to virginity and sexuality again. So you can see that, you know, there is quite a common understanding that flowers equal sex. And then we have the nurse using flower. Now, she uses it in a very different way. So she's used it in kind of a sexual connotation. But also it's about that appearance and reality. And so this idea that you can have a flower and we'll go to talk about roses, this idea that something can look good, but actually they're not really that good. And we can see this idea that he's kind of OK. He's not the flower of courtesy, which she means as 
is not the most courteous. He's not the most you know, friendliest and kind of politest in there. So we can see how this use of the image flower changes. But then we have Julia when she discovers Romeo's hand in killing Tybalt. She describes him as a flowering face. And this idea that flowering has deceived her. And it could relate to this idea of his, you know, his sexual sexuality. But, you know, there's also about appearance, that this flower has been hiding something underneath, that there's been a serpent hiding underneath this flower, underneath it. So you can see how flowers can be used in quite a number of ways. Now, there's further imagery about flowers. In fact, there's 19 men mentions of the word flower in the play. Now, you don't need to mention that fact, but it just shows you how important it is in the story. So if you take it a little bit further, OK, now, when Juliet is supposedly dead, the dad then talks to talks about her as being a flower. Now, not no longer a bud because she hasn't married, but he's almost in a way psychologically refers her as an adult because in the beginning she was a bud. And in some way, he's kind of said that she has grown up now. And so when he describes her, she, he describes her as the sweetest flower and he describes that the way that she died is that, you know, that death has, there she lies, flower she was, so repeating flower, but also this idea that death has deflowered her, which means taken away her virginity, and this idea that, you know, she's now married to death. And so it's interesting that even in death, he's talking about plants, and he's using these images to show us this idea. But again, it's interesting that he refers to the sexuality and the sex in this moment of death and this idea that really, and we can think about Elizabethan society, how men were more focused about their legacy and their children having uh, offspring so that they could carry on their legacy. And so here, at the moment of her death, he is still thinking of those ideas about what her role in society is, is to be for the person that's going to pass on the next line of his legacy. And then we have this idea of obviously bridal flowers and this idea that we have in weddings, that weddings can actually, we have flowers and then in funerals, we have flowers. And so there's almost kind of a, a cycle to the process and, and a connection that death and marriage are very, very similar. Hence why he describes Juliet's death as being deflowering, this whole idea that there is something natural or something to do with life in the whole process of flowers. And then even Paris himself, he calls her a flower, again, you know, linking into that sexuality, but also this idea that he gives her flowers as well. So there's constant references to flowers all the way through the story. Now then, there is even more specific nature in terms of plants and also flowers. So obviously we've got Juliet when she's talking about Romeo and she refers to him as a rose. And this idea that, you know, again, we've got a very, very specific, precise reference to a flower. OK, so and we all know with roses that they smell lovely and they're beautiful, but also they've got thorns. And it shows us that complication that's around Romeo. Then also we've got the nurse and we've got reference throughout the story of Rosemary. Now, Rosemary, um, going back to Elizabethan times and previously to that, is that Rosemary used to be used, seen as a sign of fertility, but also it was used in a way to kind of cover the smell of dead bodies. So you'd have Rosemary that would be around the body so that it would cover the smell of it. And so you can see that there is a close link between life and death. And we've got that in the story, along with roses. And look at how, you know, Fire Lawrence refers to Juliet when he says that you will look like you're dead. He refers just to roses. And that is a direct connection to how she refers to Romeo as being a rose. So you can see that there are patterns and there are threads as we go through the story. Now, you don't need to remember all of these, but it just helps you to get an idea of things that you can talk about in the exam. If you were to get this or if there was a connection, if you were looking at the relationship between life and death. And so you can see those things there. Now, further on, and something, it's not a direct motif, but it is something that is of relevance, is that there is lots 
of scenes where it takes place in a garden. So we have Act 2, OK, several scenes, and then we have Act 3. And so, you know, we have the garden and we know what happens in gardens. Gardens is about growing things and about helping things to grow. OK, and in a way, there's a metaphor for what we've got in life. And with Romeo and Juliet, what are the parents' responsibility to help the child grow? But also we can link it into the Garden of Eden. And there is a symbol there. And this idea that the Garden of Eden is a perfect place, somewhere that's safe. However, there is the serpent and the temptation that's involved in there. And we could look, explore the idea of what is the temptation in the story. Now, taking it further, and one of the big things in this story, and if I was ever talking about plant imagery, it would have to be Friar Lawrence. Because Friar Lawrence, in a way, typifies what adults should be doing. He is a bit sneaky, OK? He does things that he shouldn't do. However, he is, in a way, a model of what we should do in life. And this idea of helping young people grow. And in his little speech that he gives before Romeo arrives to tell him the good news about that he's met Juliet, OK, is he talks about this idea about flowers and he's in his garden and he's looking after flowers and he's talking about herbs and this idea that there is potential within a plant to be both good and bad. And this idea that his role as the fire as a kind of heavenly father, or even as a divine figure, is to help young people choose the right path, because they can either do something bad or they can do something good. And so in this idea that we've got this image again in this story about how the two aspects to life are being good and bad, and how actually it's the adult's responsibility to kind of help them. To get to the right place. So you can see that there are a number of different things in the story that help us with this idea about how we've got this motif of plants in the story. So if you have a look at it, so just pulling it all together, so we've got buds, flowers, we've got specific flowers or herbs, rosemary, rose, we've got the idea of the garden, and then we've also got the idea of the gardener. So we've got lots of concepts that are in the story using these images. So we've got fertility. We've got this idea of sexuality. OK, this idea of duality, that there are two aspects to a person that you can be either good or bad or that we need to guide people. Because, you know, what do plants do? They grow towards the light, but they can get caught up by weeds. This idea of innocence and temptation and education. And potential. So these are big ideas that we can link into the idea of motif and this image that's running through the story. But then we can kind of think about, well, what is Shakespeare teaching us? Well, I think he's sort of saying about the natural world and the importance of the natural world. Now, a lot of Shakespeare's plays does have a natural element in there. Nature forms a part of the world that Shakespeare is talking about. And so we will link in there. So we have got, for, for example, lots of references to birds in the story. That is another motif in the story. And, but also we have that sea as well. That is a common one. So he's exploring how man's relationship with nature and actually how man is like nature how man is like a plant. But also it's exploring this idea of nature and nurture, okay, and how important it is that we have in our nature to be both good and evil. However, it's the nurturing. And actually what the play is showing us is the importance of nurture, that we need to make sure that young people are guided to do the right things. And so then we can say that this story is about the role of adults in the development of the child. So the ending of the play is basically the adults realise that they should have worked harder to help the children. And also we see about society's role in that development, because actually the Capulets and the Montagues are a product of their society. And it's not just the adults' faults, it's society that's made them like that. They're so obsessed about their legacy, and about status and about wealth, they've forgotten about the young people. But also, 
this story and Shakespeare's teachings about the complexity of things. Now, growing a plant, plants don't do always do what you want them to do. So you have to keep looking after them and keep tending them. And actually this idea that, you know, you can't just let things go and they'll be all right. You have to guide them. Hence why the friar's idea of being the gardener and looking after. And also it's about the journey of life, which actually in this story is quite ironic, isn't it? Because the story is cut short. This journey for these people ends quite quickly. So there's just a quick little talk about looking at motifs. Now, certainly have a think about other motifs that you could refer to in the story and think about other ideas that you can kind of link together with this idea of plants. Um, do check out our other videos on the YouTube channel. And if there's any questions, feel free to email me.